Does everybody flirt at work? Of course not. Do they know that? Of course they do. But they're making Chris feel comfortable enough to open up and take ownership of his role in the affair and its fallout. And he's resisting doing it. And the next time I pause, I'm going to point out what I think that means as far as our analysis of him as a psychopath or as a a bumbling, innocent victim fall guy or as a third topic, something different than a psycho or a fall guy. Is Chris Watts a psychopathic killer, a manipulated fall guy, or something else? I'm Deception Detective, an attorney trained in statement analysis. This channel exposes lies and manipulation. Today we're going to analyze a rare Chris Watts interview to determine if he is a psychopathic killer, a manipulated fall guy, or something else entirely. If you've seen my Nicole Kessinger playlist, my conclusion might surprise you. And for reference, this interview is from 2019 and was uploaded with newly cleaned up audio by a friend of the channel, Watch the Obsession. Her link is in the description. And if you want to help decide who we analyze next on the channel, let's get this video to 50,000 views, which is why I'm continuing this series. Or you can become a channel member and Decide who we cover next in one of my channel member community polls. Without further ado, let's listen. Since the point of this analysis is how to spot a psychopath, we're going to start at the part of this interview where Chris is talking about Nicole, because I've already analyzed Nicole. Now I want to analyze Chris and we can determine if he is a manipulator and psychopath himself, or if he was the victim of Nicole Kessinger who manipulated him to kill his family to be with her and then take the fall for her, as some people speculate in my comments. So Watsy Obsession has conveniently put timestamps here, and we're going to jump to timestamp 1510, where she's labeled Mistress Nicole Kessinger, when, how we met. We're going to listen from there. No, there may have been others. So Nicole was the only one? No, I was the only one. Was there ever like a one night stand with someone else just out of the blue and one and done? No. Okay. All right. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about Nicole? All right. And so walk me through it because that was one of the things we never really got to ask you about. Right. We didn't talk. And, you know, and, you know, talked about where the girls were, but so what happened there? So it was probably around probably June 1st or something. That's when I first met her. And uh, it was just, like a work conversation that she messed with the gas meters that, you know, we're out in the field and I'm out messing up. And then, you know, I took it to her like, Hey, you know, what's going on with this? Like, I don't fix it. And, you know, after that, you know, we just ran into each other a few times in the office and I think it was probably the fourth time meeting. Um, she had asked me, cause like when I, we were talking back and forth, I would say, uh, you know, like, we moved here from Colorado or from North Carolina and stuff like that. And then uh, she was like, what's all this weed stuff? You come like, oh, I took up my phone and showed her a picture. Like, you know, my girl's on the phone. It's like, oh, okay. And like, so you're like, yeah, like, you know, I don't wear, I didn't wear a ring at work. Cause like I sent off so I get refitted when I lost all that weight. So, but, um, you lost so much weight that your fingers lost weight. Yeah. It was literally like, I was out in the snow one time. I went like that ring went off on the rocks. So. Ever since I started analyzing Nicole Kessinger four months ago, I've seen lots of comments of people suggesting that Chris was either pushed to commit the murders by Nicole manipulating him, or even by Shanann's needling and belittling him. And over in the DD forum, someone actually mentioned a lot of theories about this to me, which I addressed over there in the forum. And my main question was, where do these theories come from? Because as far as I'm concerned, Chris Watts committed these murders alone. And any manipulation or needling of him was done without the expectation that he would go all out and murder his entire family. All that is to say, I think that Chris originated all these theories about how other people might have contributed to the murders because he's clearly skilled at blame shifting. For instance, he's been minimizing his courtship of Nicole with the word just. I just did this, I just did that, and so on. And manipulators often use minimizing adverbs like just and merely to downplay incriminating context. This is so common of manipulators, it's even a card in my deception deck, my 52 favorite rules for spotting lies and manipulation. So does Chris's manipulativeness mean that he's a psychopath? Not necessarily. 
we need to keep listening before we draw any conclusions about how we should approach him and whether or not we should approach our analysis of him as a psychopath. For now, when I hit play, just pay attention to how he minimizes his own responsibility for the affair with his word choice, where he's constantly painting himself as a aw shucks victim of Nicole's relentless advances. From North Carolina and stuff like that. And then uh, she's like, what's all this weed stuff you come like, God, oh, took up my phone, show her a picture, like, you know, my girl's on the phone. It's like, oh, okay. She's like, so like, yeah, like, you know, I don't wear, I didn't wear a ring at work because like, I sent off so I get refitted after I lost all that weight. So, but, um, you lost so much weight that your fingers lost weight. Yeah, it was literally like I was out in the snow one time. I went like that, ring went off on the rocks. So I was like, I was panicking trying to find out that I can't wear this anymore. <laughs> but, um, so after that, she left me alone for a couple of days and she texted me outside the field. And then after that, we just kept texting back and forth. And it was just, you know, just like, you know, like she used to work in a little rig out. And... Right. So he has an excuse for everything. He showed her the photo of his family. It was in the ball was in her court to do something wrong. He had an excuse for not wearing his wedding ring. She left him alone for a couple of days. North Dakota, I think. And uh, we just kind of shredding the stories back and forth about what we did and everything. And then one day it just kind of went to a different, different level. And then I never thought it would ever go to that level. But she was talking about meeting up after we got back from San Diego. Uh, yeah, San Diego from the 22nd to the 26th of June. And uh, we met up after, after, we, got, after we got back. And uh, how did you guys meet up? Uh, at a park in uh, Thornton, at, yeah, Thornton somewhere. Um, and after that, we just kept seeing each other pretty much the whole month of July. So, let me ask you this um, you tell me if I'm wrong, you strike me as somewhat of a shy person. So, when you guys were meeting, did it was just kind of very initiatory, like flirting at first, okay, from both sides? Yeah, it was just kind of like. Feeling each other out, it's kind of yeah. like I don't, yeah. Um, and so, texts, any calls? More near the end of June. Okay. And what makes you remember that it's June that it, that it happened? Because we called each other before I left to go to San Diego. Oh, okay. All right. Um, at first, did you think something might happen? I just thought it was just. Learning, I didn't think it was actually like something that would actually yeah. happen. Yeah. Well, it's totally natural, right? I mean, everyone kind of flirts at work, right? Because um, the relationship between men and women is different. So if you're working with a girl at work, it's just kind of natural to flirt. I, you know, I wish I was on the field more. If you've seen my previous videos in this series analyzing Nicole Kessinger, you'll know that I think the interviewer who interviewed her did a terrible job. For example, he fed her answers. And he even did something which I used as the preview clip for my video, How to Expose a Manipulator, because it was so egregious. He actually mocked her for being too talkative, which is the exact opposite of what an interviewer should do. Like, I, so much. You like to talk, I can tell a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> 400, when she was young, she'd crank out about 400 words a minute. Gusts up to 600. <laughs> oh, thank you. yeah, You're a talker, so I'm... By contrast, the officers interviewing Chris Watts here are using much better technique. Does everybody flirt at work? Of course not. Do they know that? Of course they do. But they're making Chris feel comfortable enough to open up and take ownership of his role in the affair and its fallout. And that's why this interview is so illuminating because they're giving him the opportunity to take responsibility, even one iota of responsibility for what happened, and he's resisting doing it. And the next time I pause, I'm going to point out what I think that means as far as our analysis of him as a psychopath or as a, a bumbling, innocent victim fall guy or as a third topic, something different than a psycho or a fall guy. That's totally natural, right? I mean, everyone kind of flirts at work, right? Because um, the relationship between men and women is different. So if you're working with a girl at work, it's just kind of natural to flirt. I, you know, I wish I was on the field more so the office those down yeah. So even there, he wishes he was out in the field more. Whatever happened isn't his fault. 
he's just a victim of circumstance. If he'd been out in the field more, he wouldn't have fallen victim to the circumstances of Nicole pursuing him. That's, uh, that's kind of where the path started, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if I was like, because when I was a field, when I went from a, like a rover to a field coordinator, like I would spend more time in the morning time in the office trying to get everything like situated where we're going to go, and everything like that. You know, if I was a rover, I'd be more out in the field mm -hmm. and instead of like going to the office like for well, more than an hour. Right. That's just true. gave me more time to run into her pretty much. Yeah. Okay. What did she know about you? Did she know you were married first? She did once I showed her the pictures yeah. on the phone. Yeah, I'm like, you know, the home screen picture. Mm -hmm. So, was your wife in that picture, or was it just your girl? It was just my girls right there, but my wife was the like the lock screen. Oh, so she knew I was married. My kids. Yeah. Are you aware that she said she didn't know you were married? Yeah, what did you think about that? I figured it was like just trying to save face, trying to you know. I was just trying to. And some of my sister said it was like uh, just trying to keep things together. Yeah. You know, just trying to, she, she, she phrased it a different way, but just kind of like, uh, just like ground control, just trying to control everything that's going on around her. Cause I'm sure she got bombarded by all kinds of different sides from the media and everything. So, and Did you talk to her at all? No. Uh, I'm no. hoping she hasn't like, you know, written me in a different alias or something. No, I'm not talking to her that way. Oh. Uh, uh, and are you not allowed to talk to her? I, I would hope that. Okay. No one told you that then? No, I mean, I would I would expect, like, uh, I, I thought, like, in Colorado, it said, like, on a DOC list, of, if you're on, a, like, a victim list, you can't call anybody. Oh, right. But here, I'm not sure if that's the same. Well, okay, I just talked to my sister, parents, uh, some friends of my parents. Do you wish you could talk to her? Maybe once, just to... Just get some closure? Just to say, like, hey, you know, just once. <laughs> yeah. Say, like, I'm sorry this all happened. I'm sorry. I'm not sure, like, what happened, like, afterward. I'm sorry this all happened. I'm not quite sure what happened. Even in a hypothetical apology to Nicole, Chris cannot bring himself to take any responsibility for anything, whether it's the courtship and the affair, or the murder, or even the fallout that resulted from the murder. And it's this lack of remorse and self-centeredness that convinces me Chris is a psychopath. And now that we're convinced, or at least I am, that he's a psychopath, the next step in our analysis is to determine which type of psychopath he is. Because when it comes to detecting lies, psychopaths are extremely adept at fooling people. They can be very convincing and they can play the victim card very well. So if you've seen my videos how to catch a psychopath or how to spot a psychopath, you're probably all already familiar with these, but I like to put lying psychopaths into two buckets, bold psychopaths and calculating psychopaths. And once we determine which one Chris is, we'll be able to be even more nuanced in protecting ourselves against his manipulations. All that said, big caveat, I am not a clinician, so I cannot diagnose a psychopath. The behavior panel have pointed out on one of my videos, they don't agree with my psychopath checklist. Personally, I think my checklist is useful for spotting a psychopath so that you can guard yourself against the way they lie. Remember, the point of my channel is to help you spot lies and manipulation. Not to be a therapist or cure these people. My advice has always been, whether we're analyzing psychopaths or addicts or sadists, is if you recognize the signs, just get them out of your life. So when I hit play, ask yourself, is Chris a big and bold storyteller like Casey Anthony or OJ Simpson, or is he more calculating like Jada Pinkett Smith or Stephen Stearns or Jody Hildebrand? Through like, if you had like counseling, if you're like, you know, different state, if you had to leave everything behind, I just wanted to really show I'm sorry that nothing ever saw in my life happening or happening to somebody else either. Would you be all right if we told her that? That's fine. Do you want her to? Do you want her not to? And if she would want to, even talk to you guys, I'm not sure. So I'm, not I'm sure she answered your phone call more than the attorney phone call that she didn't want to go answer. Yeah. Oh, so your attorney tried to call her and she wouldn't answer? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I remember. I remember her phone number, but uh, after that, they figured out, I guess, where she lived. Yeah.
they left a call a business card there that she just pretty much after like the fifth attempt they said she said stop <laughs> I don't know. yeah yeah i'm sure she's getting bombarded like everyone else so and hopefully it's calmed down since but but uh, i'm sure like i just hope she can like like i'm not there's like normalcy we'll, we'll for her not since she's on the outside but i'm hoping it can get that way at some point i'm not sure if she had to leave colorado or not but i'm sure we that would have been hard if she did mm -hmm. So no matter how was in dream job, so uh, that's one thing I always like asked my attorneys is like, uh, did she have to leave? Like, did she have to do anything at work? Because that was one thing. So she always told me that was her dream job. So, mm -hmm. oh really? Yeah. What does she mean? Uh, like the get what like an old company in the dark. I was like, yeah. I mean, unless you work like BP or like company or something. Oh, I see what you're saying. And the dark goes like in looks like big leagues. Yeah. Right. Can I ask kind of a mm -hmm. question? Yeah. Um, did you love her? I felt like it was true. Yeah. Chris can't definitively say he loved Nicole. Yeah, I think that's true was the best he could muster up. And that is expected of a psychopath. Psychos do not feel emotions like you and me. And I've been saying this ever since the beginning when I started this series. Before I even analyzed Chris, this is the first time I've analyzed any of Chris's words. Up until now, I've only analyzed Nicole's interviews. But based on what Nicole said and based on the facts around this case, I came to the opinion that Chris didn't kill his family because he loved Nicole. He wanted to be with Nicole, and the quickest, most convenient way to achieve that was simply to kill his family. Divorces are messy, they're time-consuming, and they're expensive. And his wife was pregnant, so even if he divorced her, he'd still have 18 years of child support and potentially alimony to pay. Psychopaths look at the world in terms of people being useful and not useful. And Chris determined that his family was no longer useful. So if you agree with me that Chris is likely a psychopath, or at least close enough to a psychopath that we can analyze him based on my criteria, our next step is to say whether or not he is a bold psychopath are a calculating psycho. So here's the four tells of a bold psycho. And when I say bold psycho, think of someone like OJ Simpson or Casey Anthony or Amber Heard, who we've analyzed on the channel. They have very convincing face and body language. They can display duper's delight. In other words, the elation of getting away with a lie when any normal person like you or me would likely be too stressed to be all giddy about getting away with a lie. We'd be too focused on pulling off the lie. They tell big, bold stories, but those stories lack emotional and relationship details. And they struggle face to face. So if you have the opportunity to interview one of them, you want to get them to sit down with you so that you can expose them. Which is why I've invited Don Wells for an interview in my Summer Wells series, who declined, as well as Chris Proudfoot in my Sebastian Rogers series, who also has not gotten back to me. But I don't think Chris falls into the bold psychopath category. Instead, I think he falls into the calculating psychopath category like Candace Wells. And here's the trademarks of a calculating psychopath. They excel at evasion and distraction. So rather than boldly lying to your face, they'll likely try to distract you or go on a tangent so that they can minimize the amount of lying they have to do. They excel at information treatment. In other words, they can tell you the truth and the whole truth, but they can also add more to it that distorts it. Kind of like how Chris was talking about not wearing his wedding ring. I think that was all true, but he made sure to mention that and didn't mention any other circumstances about him flirting with Nicole. In other words, he treated the information to look like a good guy. They use excessive narcissistic words like I, me, and my. And as we've seen here, Chris does appear to be very self-centered, if not totally narcissistic because I can't diagnose him. And fourth, calculating psychopaths, just like every psychopath, has a below average IQ. So don't let movies like American Psycho fool you. Psychopaths are usually dumber than the average person. 
As we listen on, look out for Chris evading sensitive topics by distracting the interviewers. Also look out for him telling totally true stories, but treating the information in order to paint everything in a certain light. And as we've seen so far, he likes to paint himself in the light of a victim. An aw shucks every man who's always at the mercy of these conniving and bullying women. Finally, look out for his narcissism, especially in his use of narcissistic words. Remember, even though he's expressed no remorse for it, his little daughters and his wife are all dead. Can I ask kind of a tough question? Yeah. Um, did you love her? I felt like it was true. Yeah. I think so, too. I think it was the same from her. Okay. Um... Tell us about the time it's spent with her. Well, I mean, it felt like it was, you know, I think like when you said like more, more like a shy guy, it's kind of like I never like been pursued by anybody before. It's kind of like I was the one, you know, trying to pursue. Cause like when me and Shanann met, it was like, you know, she was always like pushing me away, kind of like, you know. She was sick for a while, right? Oh yeah, she had, yeah, she was, uh, she had just got diagnosed with lupus and she was on like a bunch of different medication and stuff. And, um, it was like I guess I was one of her type. And you weren't her type. I, I wasn't her type because like she 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 told me like when I, when, I, when she first because we had met she told you that. Yeah, <laughs> you're not. Yeah. I remember you telling me that. <laughs> yeah, it was like you know when we first met like was at a movie theater and my uh, cousin's ex wife set us up. You were dressed like shit, weren't you? <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't, that's what you told me. Yeah, I didn't know like that. <laughs> Have any games? So she was fancy. Whatever. She was in like shorts and was, tennis shoes or something, right? Like, Should know the doorman. You know, was in a suit. And I was just like, oh, this isn't good. I like when you have the theater. It was a fancy theater, right? It was Kinda? in Charlotte. It was called the Epicenter. Apparently, they give you like champagne and all kinds uh, of stuff. Uh, oh, this is a fancy date night theater. Yeah, yeah. I think he came. I think he came like he was going to a. Like I was Cinemax, like, 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 uh, like, like AMC <laughs> like theater. No, it was like like you like you just watch the normal normal movie, but like you can like drink champagne and yeah. like have like you know a jack and coke beside the theater and just yeah. sit there and whatever. But like uh, yeah, it's when she first saw me, she was like, I should probably just turn and talk, talk to the bartender a little more. <laughs> no, I'm not like I'm not, I'm not here to meet. Once again, Chris uses information treatment to portray himself as a lovable, aw shucks underdog who's teased and tormented by a wily woman. Just this time, it's Shanann. Of course, just like a story told by any calculating manipulator, it could be interpreted differently. For example, consider it this way, without the information treatment. Shanann spent hours finding a play for them to go to. She booked the tickets. She was excited about a big night out with Chris, so she spent hours in the mirror dolling herself up, picking out an outfit, and then he shows up like he just rolled out of bed. Now, with my information treatment, who is the deflated, belittled victim, and who is the one taking their partner for granted? This is the hallmark of calculating manipulators, whether it's Chris Watts or Jada Pinkett Smith. They do not necessarily lie the way a big, bold, psychopathic liar lies. Instead, they distort the truth by what they highlight, like Chris did here with Shanann belittling him and humiliating him by flirting with the bartender, and what they decide to minimize, like him minimizing the fact that he put little to no effort into the date, which probably belittled and humiliated Shanann. And of course, the tone they use when they tell the story. And we saw Nicole Kessinger do a lot of this, where they say verbatim what they said, but they use a very different tone than they likely used in real life. This is why we must be very careful about jumping to conclusions regarding Shanann, because she's not around to defend herself or tell her side of the story. Everything we know about her as a wife is filtered through Chris whose goal is to be perceived as a victim. He would love nothing more than the general public to think that Shanann 
pushed him over the edge by belittling and humiliating him, or that Nicole Kessinger manipulated him into killing his family. And since I've mentioned Shanann, and I'm aware there's many theories out there about how she wasn't the perfect partner and she might have even been sadistic, I'll just reiterate what I said in the DD forum back in March. Shanann Watts was a victim in this tragic event, not the perpetrator, and I am opposed to contributing to Chris's attempts to garner sympathy by assigning even one iota of blame to her without undeniable proof. As I often emphasize in my videos, psychopaths are highly skilled at making themselves appear as the victim. And that is what I think is going on, and I called it back then before I'd even analyzed one word from Chris. There are no sacred cows on my channel, as everyone knows, but I do think we can let Shanann rest in peace. She first saw me, she was like, I should probably just turn and talk, talk to the bartender a little more. <laughs> no, I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not here to me. But yeah, like it was, I was like persistent trying to pursue something. I, I liked her. And mm -hmm. uh, even, even like, even on the first day, like I couldn't even eat anything really. I was just like, you know, she's so nervous. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah, it was just, she was just like, you know, chowing down. And she was like, you eat like a bird. I'm like, oh, it's not like this. And she talked to my parents like, you know, months later, she was like, this guy just never ate. He's like, this guy eats like a trash disposal. This trash disposal. I'm like, no, that was not around me. I was like, well, I'm just nervous. <laughs> and I was just like, I was always like shaking and everything. But um, yeah, it was, I was always pursuing her. And then just like, um, finally, I just I grew on to her. Like, you know, I would always like, like with her medications and stuff, I would always like, she had like eight bottles of medication. So I would always get like her day and nights and kind of like put them all in that little, you know, flip open and go box, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you know, I would always, you know, be around her. I even went to her colonoscopy. She said after that, she knew that I was like a, kind of a keeper. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I, who goes to a colonoscopy after three months with somebody? Right. That's a little soon. <laughs> <laughs> but she asked if she needed a ride. I'm like, yeah. She's like, you want to go across my colonoscopy with me? I'm like, sure, why not? Like, even sat with her while she drank that nasty stuff all day. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's <laughs> Or she's in the bathroom all day. Yeah. <laughs> like, like clear stuff that's not real, that doesn't really taste clear. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it felt like a great. It was a great relationship. Everything was. Everything was great. Now you're talking about with Kissinger. No, with uh, Tom Walsh and and uh, like in the first first year, you know, like yeah, you know, my parents never. Oh, I don't know. My mom was always kind of hesitant. Why? I was. I was the, Baby, I guess I never. So this, I never had a girlfriend in high school, so it's kind of like she never like really saw me. Like, oh, interesting. So she's kind of watching her baby walk out a little bit. Yeah, because I, when I turned eighteen, I graduated. I never moved back. Okay. That that at all. So and my sister old? moved back and forth. <laughs> so, so. How old were you when you met Shanann? I was twenty five. I was twenty ten. So. Based on the way Chris was telling the stories earlier, I would not have guessed that he was 25 when he met Shanann. And once again, it's the power of information treatment. He paints himself as this shy, virginal, henpecked little boyfriend who's too nervous to eat on the first date and is shuffling his demanding girlfriend around to appointments. And besides the manipulation of painting himself as this lovable aw shucks victim, we're also seeing glimmers of narcissism and psychopathy as far as my amateur assessment goes. For example, when it came to Shanann's illness, he's the victim. Well, I had to sit there when she was drinking that disgusting clear stuff. Poor little Chris. How many words does he spare lamenting what Shanann was going through or empathizing with her being sick and having to be shuttled around? Not one. In other words, all of this is spoken like a true calculating manipulator, if not a psychopath. And when I hit play, listen closely, because when Chris gets pressed about never having a girlfriend before, as he claims here, he actually changes his story, which is just a nice little confirmation that he's being fast and loose with the facts. So no serious girlfriends before that? Not, nothing more than... Like six months or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was there was a, there was some girls here and there, but just nothing more. Like you know, uh, the last girlfriend I had before Shanann, she was just actually got divorced, and I should, should never did that. But 
it was more of like a, I was kind of like helping her get through her divorce. It seemed like mm -hmm. she went off somewhere else. I'm like, oh, nice to know. You're the rebound guy. <laughs> the rebound guy. Pretty much. But you know, not how it goes. Would you say that in your relationships with women, um, it seems to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, it seems to me like you're attracted to maybe a more dominant personality? It seemed like it because I'm more of the just reserved. I mean, I just kind of like go with the flow type. Yeah. That and like, Stan usually made all the decisions, seemed yeah. like. So I get that. I'm saying, yeah, I don't know what it is. Yeah. I don't think that's right with you, but. <laughs> So then, and I know it's hard to keep bouncing back and forth, but, and, and one of the reasons we're here is we just keep telling ourselves, Christ just does not fit the mold. Christ is not, no. like this, this, it just blows us away what happened, right? And so we will do a little bit of bouncing back and forth, and that's really just to get to know you a little bit better. And we never really got that chance to be. We're not just twice. Yeah. Not two ones. Yeah. Probably like three, well, remember three or four times, probably. So then when you call her Nikki or Nicole? I would call her Nikki. Okay. I know. There's so many Nikki and Nicole's in this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got confused. So we'll call her Nikki. Okay. Uh -huh. So then with Nikki, was it different? It just seemed like I was more in control, it seemed like. And that never happened. Like, she actually, like, asked me, like, like my opinion on a lot of things, just like what I wanted to do, and just kind of like, okay. As new, wasn't it? Very new. It's fascinating to me. Once again, everything Chris is saying could very likely be true. Shanann could have been the leader in their relationship and even domineering at times. But Chris's presentation of the events, down to his shaky, feeble voice as he recounts the relationship, appears calculated to give the impression of a victim. And since so much of this video revolves around information treatment, I'll just read you the relevant card from my deception deck. The card is Spotting Common Lies, and it is in the Concepts suit. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Testimony Oath. When evaluating statements for deception, consider the three components of the Testimony Oath. One. Commission. This involves bold-faced lies of commission, where an individual outright contradicts the oath's pledge to tell the truth through direct falsehoods. In other words, bold liars. 2. Omission. Here, lies of omissions occur. The subject tells part of the truth, but intentionally omits incriminating, crucial information not adhering to the whole truth and this is the most common type of lie. And third, distortion. The final method of lying involves information treatment. The truth is presented is warped with additional language, such as exclusion qualifiers or a passive tone, deviating from nothing but the truth. And this is the difference between bold liars who lie by commission, average liars who lie by omission, and then calculating liars who lie with information treatment. In other words, they're not technically lying. And that's what I believe we have with Chris a lot of the time here. So when I hit play, pay attention to how Chris frames his dates with Nicole. The picture he paints is if he's a little boy sneaking away with her and discovering a new world of opportunities. He can go camping with her or watch a drag race, things he's always wanted to do. Of course, nothing was preventing him from doing any of these things this entire time. And it certainly wasn't Shanann. He met her when he was 25 years old, and she couldn't even prevent him from sleeping over at Nicole's house multiple nights during their courtship. In other words, if you have a manipulator in your own life, they probably manipulate you the same way Chris is attempting to manipulate his audience by painting themselves in a very different light without telling any actual lies. It just seemed like I was more in control, it seemed like, and that never happened. Like, she actually, like, asked me, like, like my opinion on a lot of things, just, like, what I wanted to do, and just kind of, like, okay. That was new, wasn't it? Very new. It's fascinating to me. 
And so did it feel more like an equal partnership or? It seemed like it. Yeah. Okay. So then when it was date night, would you guys talk about it? Would you ask to go somewhere? Or would she say, I want to go somewhere? Was it too I, You know, the first time they went out, it was to a movie over at the orchard, about the 144th over mm-hmm. there. And you know, I asked her, like, hey, you want to go see this movie? And like, she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. And we just we got there. It was sold out. I mean, you know, normally I'm probably just after, you know, just wait two hours. Like, no, just go home. But now she just wanted to walk around and just talk. I'm like, okay. Oh, wow. So that was, that was different. And, you know, I think... She wanted to go to the car museum, shelf museum in Boulder. I've never been there. And I was, That's right up your alley. So yeah, I, I was just like, that was awesome. Just to walk around cars for like an hour or so. And then, you know, drag race in Vandermeer. Okay. Not haven't been to a drag race since 2008. Now Charlotte. Okay. Like that was the drag strip over there. This like the NHRA, the top tool, mm-hmm. fun car stuff. Like me and my dad used to grow up. So yeah, go there like all the time. And then like uh, we went to camping in uh, Sand Dunes National Park, mm-hmm. and I never, I, I never been camping. I always wanted to do it. Thought it was she done it like countless times. Like, oh really? Okay. So, she's outdoorsy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, she she I guess she. Every time, like she even needed to clear her head, she just go by herself. This go somewhere else. Oh. Yeah. So she's a completely new type of uh, person and relationship. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. What were you thinking this whole time? Like, I did. I, in the back of my head, I was just telling myself, "What are you doing?" Like, you know, every time, you know, I, I open up my phone, I can see pictures, like. So my wife and my kids, I'm just like, what am I doing? And then, like, every time I was with her, it seemed like didn't think. It seemed like it was like a, like a blinder that was on my face. Oh. And it was, like, every time I look back on it, like, you know, like, I have pictures of my wife and kids and myself. And, like, every night, you know, or every morning, every night, you know, I just, you know, talk to them, you know, say, like, like I have, like, this book. Uh, I used to read for CC. And I remember that book, so I read that to, to them like every night. And like there's some scripture and stuff that I read to them, so I just try to, you know, just try to think back. Like I was just I was just like, I wish that blinder wasn't on my head, but weren't in my eyes. That would have seen what was going on. Like Once again, Chris cannot take responsibility for anything he did. He blames everything he did on these blinders, and I wish I didn't have these blinders. It's not my fault. So now we're getting into the details of Chris's relationship with Nicole. And remember, if Nicole was involved in the planning, execution, or cover-up of the murders, this is where we might get some clues about that. Especially if we detect for the first time so far in this interview that he's attempting to minimize her involvement in any stage of the murders, since he's done the opposite so far across this entire interview, blaming everyone but himself for everything, down to the affair, the courtship, and even the little blinders on his head. If you've not seen my analysis of Nicole, I have plenty of questions about her too. They're on your screen now. I recommend watching them next. And if you want to continue this series, let's get this video to 50,000 views. Until next time, stay true.